But I don't watch commercials very often. Normally, if the commercial turns on the, the game or show that I'm watching, I'm flipping to something else because I don't want to watch the advertisements. I get enough advertisements elsewhere. But there's something about commercials that always uh, attracts me and kind of keeps me watching at least a little bit, and that is slogans or taglines that companies will use to draw you in and draw you to their product. And so they, they, they put some thought into it. They want to make them catchy because they want it to stay in your head so you will be influenced to get their product. And so if I were to rattle off a few, I bet some of you might be able to guess what the slogan would be. So if I were to say Nike, you might say, just do it. If I were to say milk, this might be a little bit older because we don't hear it as much, but you would hear, got milk. If I say Wheaties, you might think breakfast of champions. If I say State Farm, you're going to sing the jingle like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. My favorite one, though, my favorite one recently has been farmer's insurance. And this one kind of baffles me because farmer's insurance is we are farmers, bum, ba dum bum, 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 bum. The reason why that baffles me is because I wanted to be in the room where they pitched this idea for the first time. Like, I just wanted to know what that was like. Like, do you have this idea? Yeah, we are farmers, bum, ba dum bum, 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 bum. Brilliant, let's go with it. I, just, I wanted to be in that room. But then there are some times that companies get in over their heads and they think they're too creative, so they're gonna change a good thing to something else. And so, did you know, if you say uh, Burger King, you might think, have it your way. Did you know that in 2014, they briefly changed their name to, instead of have it your way, be your way, because they are riding that self-expression train and trying to be culturally relevant. Well, that public outcry was not warmly received, and so they quickly changed it back to have it your way. If I were to say McDonald's, you might say, I'm loving it. But did you know, McDonald's apparently didn't learn from Burger King because in 2015, they tried to change their name because instead of I'm loving it, they wanted to change it to loving, not hating. But the problem was that got leaked and then became the laughing stock of the internet. And so they never changed it. It's <laughs> like, okay, this was a bad idea. We shouldn't change it. If you're a coffee drinker and I say Maxwell House, you may know that the slogan is good to the last drop. But in the 90s, they changed the slogan to better beans make better coffee. That didn't really stick. So then in the early 2000s, they changed it to good just got great. And then when that didn't really work, in 2010, I think they went back to the way it was in the, I think is back in like the 30s, good to the last drop. People will spend millions and billions of dollars to influence you in a certain direction. Case in point, Super Bowl commercials. Have you ever researched how much money is spent on one 30-second Super Bowl commercial? It is a baffling amount of money. Why? Because they want to influence you to think a certain way. That's why there are people who are on social media platforms, and they're going to make 60-second videos because they're trying to influence you in a certain way. That's why when you go on certain um, apps, you might notice that the clock in the top left-hand corner is no longer there because they want you to be influenced to stay on their app for as long as possible and forget that you spent what well, would have been 30 minutes and now it's been three hours. That's why researchers have figured out that makers of cell phones have consulted with runners of casinos in Las Vegas to figure out what type of lighting should we use to keep them attracted to their phones. And so there's, there's this scheme at work to influence you in a certain direction. That's why our culture is kind of recognizing this. Did you know that the fastest growing answer for young children to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up in the last five years? The fastest growing answer has been a YouTuber or a video game streamer. So, and, and you might chuckle at that, but that's a legit profession these days because it is a platform and it has some influence in an area that they're interested in. And so this idea of influence is, is growing. I remember seeing an ad for HBO, and the ad was simply this family, uh, two kids and two parents sitting on a couch, and they were watching a show, and the parents kept talking over the show, and the kids were really annoyed. I would encourage you not to look to the person to your left or right and say, that's you when we watch shows. You won't be quiet. 
But when, we, when they're sitting there and they're just talking, the parents just aren't really paying attention. The kids are getting frustrated. And the tagline at the end of the HBO commercial, it was for like streaming on all devices. And so this was a few years ago. And it says, HBO now available on all your devices far, far away from your parents. When you watch that, you might chuckle because the commercial lends itself to some comic relief. But there's a message behind that slogan. The message is, let's influence you away from your parents to be isolated so then we can influence you with our programming. We all probably have some questionable thoughts on the programming on HBO. And so when you think about this, we, the world has a message and they're trying to influence us in a certain direction. Well, as Christians, we are called to be influenced more by the word of God than we are by the world. That's why most churches have a mission statement. You heard it during the announcements. We try to say it during the announcements each week that we exist as, as our mission statement. We exist to glorify God and make disciples. We want, we want that to be abundantly clear because we want that to be the influencing factor. And this isn't some, some slogan for you to buy something from us because we believe that this is what we see as the overarching theme for all believers around the world in Scripture. Glorify God and make disciples. That's going to look different in different contexts where you know, it's going to be different in Chicago versus Bowling Green, Kentucky, but the mission is still the same, glorify God and make disciples. And so this morning we're going to look at a story in John chapter 4 that starts off evangelistic, but I believe that it ends in disciple making. We're going to be talking about what does it mean to make disciples, and it's important for us to recognize that because in order to make disciples, you first have to be a disciple. So it's good that we're looking at a story that starts evangelistic because you have to be a Christian in order to make other Christians. That is a, uh, the point of it. Disciple making or discipleship sometimes get cons confused with just taking on more information, going through curriculums, reading the latest book from a seminary professor or a conference speaker. That's not disciple making. Disciple making is, says, let's remind ourselves of the gospel. Let's identify our sin and fight against it. Let's go tell others what God has done in our lives. And then here's the part that's disciple making. Then I'm going to walk alongside someone as they walk towards God. And we are both going to be walking towards Jesus together. So this morning, we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And we're going to be really kind of looking at the, most of the chapter, uh, most of chapter four, but we're going to start with verse 1. And so I know you sat down, but if you don't mind, we stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. This is John chapter 4, 1 through 15. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob was given, that had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I, may not, that I will not be thirsty or have to come to draw water. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And so I'm going to set a little bit of a context. And so behind me, you're going to see a map on the screen. And on this, on this map is going to be a layout of the area. And so, so just in case we're not familiar with the area, here, here's where we are. So we have Galilee, Samaria, and Judea all on top of one another. If you know kind of the context of the beginning of John, in John chapter 2, Jesus is beginning his public ministry, and so he's in Cana. And you'll see that at the very top of Galilee. He's in Cana for a wedding, and it says that he would, uh, 
travel a little bit there, but then eventually he travels down to Jerusalem for the start of the Passover, which brings us into John chapter 3, the interaction with Nicodemus, and then the, that's where you get the famous John 3.16 passage. And then he's traveling back north, but it says that he had to go through Samaria. And what's interesting about this is that people from, from Galilee and Judea didn't go through Samaria. You'll notice on the right-hand side, that there, you may not be able to see, but there's a little squiggly line. That's a river. That's the Jordan River, and it runs alongside the, the three regions there. And what the, the general consensus is among scholars and commentaries is that Jews hated uh, women of Samaria so, or not just women, but people of Samaria so much because of their mixed ancestry. They hated them so much they avoided them at all costs. So the, the belief is that they would travel across the Jordan River, go up in the regions on the other side of the river, and then cross into Galilee or Judea, depending on which direction you're heading. They would not want to step foot in Samaria because they believed that it would, do, it would defile them. And so you have this, you have this idea of, of we're going to, to think about influence. Well, sometimes, sometimes influence can be a negative thing within Christian communities, because this is something that the Pharisees would, would tack on to, to their journeys. They would add about a day of journey to, to travel. And so what I find interesting here is I just wanted to give you an idea of the layout of the town. But Jesus says that he, he had to go through Samaria. So this morning I'm going to give you four things that we're going to observe from the story that, that lead us to think about disciple making and apply to discipleship. Four things. I'm going to spend the bulk of our time on the first two, and then we'll hit the last two kind of quickly at the end. So the first one is this. Disciple-making pursues. Disciple-making pursues. And so if you look down at, at verse 4, John 4, 4, it says that he had to pass through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. I love that word, had, because if you remember, they, they, they would, the tradition is that they would go around and they would avoid that area. Now, he started in Cana and went down to Jerusalem, and there's no, there's no mention of him traveling through Samaria. And so the general uh, consensus, the likelihood, is that he was traveling and he went the traditional route. Now, we don't know that for certain, but, but that is the, the general consensus. If it's not uh, spoken out against it, then that's what we can lead to believe, that he took the traditional route. But on the way back, he had to go through Samaria. So when we think about it, the reason why I think that's important is because Jesus is fully God, fully man. He knows everything. He, he's, he's going to, to pursue this. He does everything with intention. And he says, I believe that he is going through Samaria to land at this exact well on this exact day at this exact time to have this exact conversation. I believe Jesus is, is doing this with intention. He is pursuing this with intention. Now, if you notice, it says that it was the sixth hour. You might have a little note at the bottom of your Bible. The sixth hour generally is about noon. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever done manual labor in the, at the middle of the day. That's usually not the most ideal time to do that. When I was in high school, uh, I had a summer job working for a construction company. And they wouldn't let me build anything. I really wanted to carry a sledgehammer, but they wouldn't let me. Um, but they wouldn't let me do anything because they didn't know what I was doing. But they said, okay, mow the grass around the construction sites. And so I did some of that. And then they said, okay, and then in the second half of the summer, what I would do is I would go help this other company that worked with the construction company to do decorative landscaping on properties that they had just built. And so what we would do is we would go to this place and we would do the, the concrete borders around flower beds. You've, maybe you've ever seen one of those, or maybe you have one. And so basically all I would do the whole day is I would just pick up bags of concrete, go mix it, make it soft, form it the way we wanted to form it, decorate it how we wanted to decorate it, and then we would go about our day. And I'll tell you, in Florida, between the hours of 11 and 2 is not the ideal time to do manual labor. If we're doing this at 8 a.m., I'm fine. But we're doing this at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm a baby. And so what I would do is I would bring the concrete over, drop it off, and then run back to shade and water as quickly as possible. And this is what, was, what is interesting is this is noon. They're carrying water drugs. It's how they would retrieve well. So this is, I mean, this is a, this is a heavy load that they're, they're happening. Notice it says the woman came to the well, not women. 
There's, there's one person coming to the well. Because most would do it in the cool of the morning. They would wait maybe even before the sun rose or as the sun is, is rising before they would go do this. There's a lot of unusual things that are happening in this passage that we should take note of. First, the woman comes at the hottest part of the day. Second, there's a, uh, most Jews avoided having any dealings with Samaritans, but Jesus had to go through Samaria. And then three, most men did not have casual conversations with women, but Jesus is intentional about starting a conversation with this woman. And so when we look at this, this story, there's a lot of interesting things that are happening compared to the context of the day that they are living in. And so he's walking up and he's having, and he's having an intentional conversation with her. There's no, hey, how are you? Right? We're, we're used to this as in, in churches. We, hey, how are you? Good. Great. End of conversation. Jesus starts and he's very intentional. There's not, hey, how's the weather? It's pretty hot today. Did you catch the game last night? Like, there's none of that. He's going straight for the heart of the issue. He wants to guide the conversation to her heart as quickly as possible. So Jesus is pursuing her. And so disciple making pursues because it makes an intentional effort to reach the heart of the person, reach the heart of the individual. So I think there are three pursuits that we need to be aware of this morning. And I don't normally do sub points, but I am today because I think these are important. First, we need to pursue Jesus. First, we, we need to pursue Jesus. So if you're a non-believer in the room, if you're a non-believer who's watching online, I want you to hear this as, as Jesus is pursuing the woman at the well. He's also pursuing you. We need to pursue Jesus. And because he's saying, if you come to me, I am the living water that you are looking for. We all know what it's like to be thirsty. Maybe, maybe you do manual labor. Maybe you're used to being dehydrated. And you're like, I have to have some water. And when you have that sip of water after you're, you're scorched from the sun, it's, there's nothing more refreshing. I mean, even if you get like Coke or something like so soft drink that we would normally drink if we're casual, if you are really, really dehydrated, literally there's nothing better than the taste of water in that moment. And Jesus is saying, you're dehydrated, you need water. I am the one that you are looking for. Water is, ne is necessary, and Jesus is like, I am necessary. So first, we need to pursue Jesus because he's the living water who can satisfy spiritual dehydration. Secondly, if you're a Christian in the room, we also need to pursue Jesus with all we are. Don't think that pursuing Jesus is what happens for non-Christians and then you, would, and you graduate to something better. You as a Christian, I don't care if you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, you're pursuing Jesus with all you are because if you try to do it on your own strength, you will fail. If you try to do it in your own strength, you will forget, fail. You need to remind yourself daily of the cross and the power of forgiveness and the, the, the power of, of freedom and grace and mercy that can be found in what Jesus did. For you need to confess your sins and rest in grace. And so from six years old to 106 years old, wherever you are on the spectrum, are you pursuing Jesus? From a college student to, to married with kids, are you pursuing Jesus? From a middle schooler to an empty nester, are you pursuing Jesus? One, pursue Jesus. Two, pursue biblical community. You need to pursue biblical community. I'm not going to get ahead of myself in the story, but at the end of the story, we'll see that the woman returns to the town, and she goes back to the community that, that had kicked her out. And it's a beautiful picture we'll get to in a minute. But pursuing Jesus is never meant to be done solo. Pursuing Jesus is never meant to be done solo. It's something that is meant for community. There's something that happens when the people of God get together and they're encouraging one another to pursue Jesus. There's something beautiful that happens. And so that's why we encourage you to get plugged in. If you're missing either pursuing Jesus or pursuing biblical community, it's kind of like having a 50-pound dumbbell strapped to your leg and you're dragging it behind you as you're running a race. You're not going to do go very far, you're not going to do very well in the race. That's why I'm so passionate about seeing people connect to our community groups because I believe that God is using the vehicle of community groups to do something special and beneficial to foster encouragement in the lives of our people. We want to see you connected in biblical community. If you're not in biblical community, I would challenge you, why not? I don't float around and just assume that if you just casually attend church then you'll develop into a strong Christian. You need to get plugged in and you need to be alongside other brothers and sisters who are going to say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling this week too. Let's help each other 
Let's hold each other accountable. Let's encourage one another. You need that in your life. The third pursuit is you need to pursue a person. (laughs) This is what disciple making is. You can't just wait for accidental connections with people. You have to be intentional about pursuing another person. In order to make disciples, you have to pursue someone. You can't just, just show up and be like, um, you, and just blindly close your eyes and point to someone. You have to be intentional about it. So that means that moms with young kids, you should be pursuing a college-age girl or a high school girl. And you should be telling them, here's what, I'm, here's what I've learned about my walk with Jesus over the last 10 years. Usually someone in a different season of life should be investing in someone in another season of life that you've already come from. So a, a senior adult man, you should grab one of these uh, young husbands who's struggling to lead his family well, and you should be pouring into him, here are the lessons that I've learned over my years. You should be, you should be investing in someone. This means parents, you should be pouring into your children. Don't just bring them to church programming, drop them off, and hope it sticks. Sometimes it does. I was a youth pastor for 10 years. Sometimes it doesn't. So you need to invest intentional time in your children, teaching them the ways of the Lord. I promise you, they spend much more time at home than they do inside the church building. So invest in them where you are. You know the most influential memory I have as a child is my dad in the mornings when he would wake up, or I would wake up, get ready for school, my dad would be sitting in his chair and he'd be doing his quiet time. And I, I mean, Dad and I have had countless conversations about Jesus and about ministry throughout my lifetime. But the one that shaped me the most was seeing my dad pursue Jesus. So seeing my dad model what pursuing Jesus looked like influenced me to pursue Jesus. So families, are you modeling for your young children? Are you modeling for someone else what it looks like to pursue Jesus? My mom, my mom loved the word of God. And sometimes she was annoying with it, so I'd be watching a show that would be like a war movie. She goes, is that beautiful in the eyes of the Lord? Like, probably not, Mom. And so she would always point me to Scripture, and sometimes I would be annoyed with it, but now I love it. Now I love it, because I can't get it out of my head. Is that beautiful? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Right, Philippians? Like, like she would just point me to the Word of God. And so those are the memories I have, or my parents modeling their pursuit and their love of the Lord for me. And that's what I remember. I don't remember the, the devotionals or the talks in detail or as much as I remember the actions of the people I watched. So believe me that your children are watching you, so you should be modeling for them. And maybe the roles are reversed. So maybe you're a young person in here, and, or and maybe you're, you're in a different season of life, and maybe you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and you don't have someone of the next generation who's older than you that can invest in you. And that's a difficult place to be. That's a difficult place. If you do, praise the Lord. That's a blessing. You should not take it for granted. But maybe you don't. Man, I would encourage you to reach out to the church. We would love to partner you with someone. We would love to find someone who says, you know what, I'll meet with them. And I'll go, we'll go get breakfast or we'll go get coffee or we'll go here and we'll just take a walk and talk about what life looks like to follow Jesus. We should be pursuing Jesus. We should be pursuing community. And then we should be pursuing another person to help them Do the same things. First thing, disciple-making pursues. Second thing, disciple-making reveals. Disciple-making reveals. Look down at at John chapter 4, 16 through 19. It says, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you have, you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Pause right there. I love that response because if someone were to come up to me that I just met in a couple minutes prior and shared an intimate detail about my life, I would say either you're a prophet or you're a fortune teller or something, and I'd be kind of freaked out. So so it's wise for her to say, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yes. He more than likely has, has some type of knowledge you are not privy to. And so what's interesting here is that Jesus is being very intentional about the conversation. He cuts straight to the heart of the issue. And the woman hears this response. And suddenly the conversation gets real intense real quickly. The conversation gets real intense. And so Jesus goes straight to the area of life that this woman was most ashamed of. And he says, I'm going to address it. I'm going to call it. I'm going to bring it out into the light. 
And he says the customs of the day were that women weren't as independent then as they are today. That they relied on men to provide and to take care of them. And if they didn't have a family, they were just kind of ostracized and they were kind of cast out. So she's not finding satisfaction in, in one husband. She's, she's bouncing around to multiple men. The one she's with now is not her husband. And so this was not looked upon favorably in her town. And so she's outcast. That's why she is drawing water from a well in the hottest part of the day. She is, she is avoiding the town because the town is shunning her, maybe gossiping about her. And Jesus has a way of revealing sin in our life that makes us uncomfortable. We don't like to talk about it. We want to stay away from it. It makes us uncomfortable when we hear the Holy Spirit say something to us when we're listening to a preacher. Maybe that doesn't happen to you. It happens to me quite frequently, and especially if the preacher says the exact sin that I'm struggling with, then I feel like my seat in those little cushions is like, is this heated? What the heck is going on? All of a sudden, I feel, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, I'm talking to you, and I have to deal with that, and I have to wrestle with that, and I can't really hide from that. And so Jesus is a way of, of identifying this, and he's saying, I'm going to identify, I'm going to, I'm going to call to light the pride and the, the envy and the anger and the bitterness and the lust and the control that you have in your heart. I'm going to call you out on it, and I want you to sit there and be uncomfortable with it and recognize this is not of me, and you need to reject it. That's why I love Psalm 32. Psalm 32 says, uh, when I don't talk about my sins, when I don't confess my sins, I feel my bones wasting away. Another part of the scripture says, so the, the hand of the Lord is laid heavy upon me. So like the, the, there's a pressure felt when we have sin in our lives. We should be uncomfortable with it and recognize that we don't need it in our lives. But sometimes we just try to ignore it. Sometimes we just try to brush it to the corner of our, of our hearts. Sometimes we treat it like we treat a junk drawer at home. You know the junk drawer, the thing where you just toss everything, but then when you need something, you can't find it because it's in the junk drawer. Sometimes we do that with sin. We're just like, oh, I'm just going to put it over here. I'm not really going to worry about it. There's a famous quote by John Owen. It says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. It's famous for a reason because that quote helps us identify the seriousness of sin and that we shouldn't play with it. We shouldn't treat it lightly. I heard a story from, from a pastor in Texas one time who said he was watching uh, Animal Planet. And have you ever seen the show When Animals Attack? It's probably not the most wholesome show in the world to watch, but it's fascinating nonetheless. And so he's watching this show, and he said he heard a story about a man who adopted a baby lion, baby cub, and he raised it as his own. And, you know, you get the Instagram pictures when they're a cub, and they're cute, and they're cuddly, and they make little meows when they're trying to roar, and it's just adorable. It's just a large cat, right? And so they're feeding it, and they're taking care of it, and it's in their bed. The problem is cats, or cats stop at a certain size. Lions they go much further than the normal size. The lions will then become this massive creature, and what happens is their instincts kick in. And what happened to this guy is he took care of this lion for X amount of years, and then the instincts of the lion came in, and the lion attacked its owner, and I don't know if he died, but he was in the hospital for a very, very, very long time. And the point the pastor was making, he's saying, sometimes we treat sin like a baby cub. That we think that we can control it. That we think that we can, if we just keep it in this corner, we put a leash on it, and we, we tell it what its food is and what it isn't, but we ignore that the instinct of the lion is to be an apex predator that's mission is to kill and assert dominance. And sometimes that's our sin, that we play around with it. And we don't think that it's out to kill us when it actually is. We need to recognize what it is, and we have to address it for what it is. So we have to recognize her sin. The woman, what happens to her is she gets defensive. We're not going to go into all of this, but she gets defensive. She, she starts to realize what's going on here, and so she starts to deflect the conversation. She goes elsewhere. She starts to talk about worship, and she's like, oh, well, what about worship? And, and she changes the topic. Jesus doesn't get mad with her. Jesus doesn't get defensive. Jesus rolls with the conversation and says, okay, you want to go here? Let's go here. And he, he walks with her. And eventually he's going to say the thing that she's been longing to hear, but she didn't know that she wanted to hear it until she heard it. Look down at verse 25. Verse 25 says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, listen to this, 
I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the one who you're looking for. So here's the beauty of disciple making is that disciple making not only reveals to us the, the, the nastiness of our sin and the brokenness that we have because of our sin, but disciple making also reveals to us the source of our healing found in Jesus Christ. And so we, we need to recognize what's happening because we can't just focus on Jesus and ignore the sin. We have to take both of them hand in hand. He reveals to us these things in our lives. And sometimes the things he reveals to us are not bad things. Things like family and your job and, and wanting to provide, you know, being healthy. Like these are good things. But here's the problem. When things that are secondary become primary, there will always be issues. Let me say that again. When things that are secondary become primary, there will always be issues. Secondary meaning things that are meant for, for pleasures and pursuits and things that God has given us just as general gifts of life. When those things become primary, the spot only reserved for God, when that happens, there will be issues. So that means when you value your family over God, there will be an issue. When you value your job over God, there will be an issue. When you value money or popularity over God, there will be an issue. And so we have to recognize that sometimes we can get our lives out of order. That's, that's the temptation that we face in our world. Jeremiah 2.13 would describe it as a broken cistern. A cistern or is like a tank. A better, he says you're trying to hold water in a broken cistern. A better way to think about it is trying to hold water in a broken bowl. It's not going to work very well. It's not, it's not going to, to work out the way you want it to work out. There's a, there's a comment that I read in this uh, study Bible as I was preparing for this. It said, the living water of grace is only sweet to those who know the bitter taste of their sin. Which is a play on words from a quote, and I believe it's from Thomas Watson. The living water of grace is only sweet to those who know the bitter taste of their sin. You have to see your sin for what it is to recognize how sweet your Savior is. So I would encourage us to pursue Jesus to recognize what he is revealing in your life. Don't cover up the sin. And be like, I know I feel guilt about this, or I know I feel conviction about this, but I'm just going to ignore it for now. Don't ignore it. That's what the enemy wants. Don't ignore it. Jesus is saying, don't brush over your sin. My grace is better. My, my living water is sweeter than anything you might taste. And here's the problem. Sometimes when we come to church, we do a very poor job of this. Sometimes when we come to church, we wear a mask. We wear a mask and says, hey, how are you? Everything's great. My life's perfect. My kids are perfect. And we, we put the mask on like, like everything's perfect in your life. But in reality is, my kids are a wreck. We got into a fight on the car ride over here. And, and, and my, where there's so much stress between me and my spouse. Okay. It's okay to admit you're struggling. It's okay to not be okay. Shocker. I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. You're a sinner who needs a Savior. And it's okay to admit that. I don't want us to put on this fake facade and act like we're okay because then someone who doesn't go to church here might come in the building and be like, well, they're perfect and they're perfect. And, they're, and then they may be like, well, I'm a mess. I don't really fit in here. And then they walk out the door and they miss the living water. It's okay to admit you have a need. It's okay to admit that, that you have uh, sin in your life. And so my question for you is, are you confessing or are you covering up? Are you deflecting like the woman at the well? Are you confessing or are you deflecting? If you should have confession be a regular part of your life. Confession should be a regular thing that you're not just wearing a mask. Because tell me, like I'll tell you from personal experience, wearing a mask is exhausting. It's exhausting to come here and fake like everything's perfect. I'm, I, I'm a pastor's kid. I've been a Christian since I was six years old. I know how to play church. It's exhausting if you're faking it. And sometimes it's liberating to go, you know what, I'm struggling. I'm struggling this week. And if I were to raise my hand and say, I'm struggling this week with anger, someone else might be like, you know what, I'm also struggling. I thought I was the only one. I'm struggling with anger. Someone else, oh, me too. And then that's where biblical community comes in. There's a beauty in recognizing your sin and recognizing that your Savior is greater. I was in a church in Texas 
recently, and they have this ministry called Regeneration Ministry, and it's like their ministry for attacking sin and following after Jesus. And they do this really beautiful thing. Anytime someone comes to the microphone and they start to talk, they always begin the same way. The guy who leads it, his name is John, and he says, Hi, my name is John, and I have a new life in Christ. Christ has set me free from, from 40 years of alcohol addiction and addiction to lust. And this week, he set me free from, from bitterness with my wife and uh, not being patient enough with my kids. And that's how they begin every single time they talk. Every single person who comes to the mic and says, hi, my name is blank. I have a new life in Christ. Here's what Christ has set me free from. There's a realness to confession. There's a realness to recognizing it's okay to be real. That's why we have times in our service where we pray. We have prayers of confession. Because we don't want to gloss over like everything's perfect. We want to recognize our need for a Savior. First, disciple-making pursues. Second, disciple-making reveals. Third, disciple-making transforms. Disciple-making transforms. Look down at verse 27. Just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left the water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So they went out of the town and were coming to him. Disciple making can transform us and others, like, just like it transformed this woman. If you recognize, there's a few interesting things just in those few short passages that we read. One, she left her water jar. It says she, she left her water jar. The very purpose for the knee, the physical knee that she was trying to get fixed, water, she left it. She's like, I, I don't even remember why I came up here. I just know that I met someone, and man, he's identified everything in my life. This could be Jesus. This could be the Christ. She had to go tell. So she left the water jar. But then she goes back to the town. She goes to the town that had kicked her out, that had talked bad about her, that had, had made her go be isolated enough where she felt like she had to go get water at the hottest part of the day. She, she was transformed because she got a taste of living water. She no longer cared about what she was doing and she had forgotten the, her sins and her past. She just knew that she had to go tell someone. That she had an encounter with the God who transformed her and she's like, I got to go tell someone. And so she experienced transformation. That can be true of us today. No matter how messy your life might be, you can experience transformation. The Holy Spirit will use disciple-making and discipleship as a pathway to take gradual steps towards Jesus. Transformation is possible through this little thing we call sanctification. Sanctification is, is the daily act of looking more and more like Jesus. That's why we want you to be connected in, in a group. We want you to be pursuing Jesus. We want you to be serving. We, these aspects help you look more and more like Jesus. So we, we begin to battle this daily progress of fighting against sin every single day to take gradual steps towards Jesus. And you might be thinking, well, my life's too messy. If you knew what was going on in my life, look, I said I'm, I'm a sinner. Some of my sins may make you blush if I were to tell you everything that I've done. But here's the beauty. If God can save me, if God can save a man like Saul who killed and imprisoned men, women, and children, you think that your sins are too much for the cross of Christ? Don't believe that lie from the enemy. Do not believe that lie from the enemy. You can, he can take your anger. He can take the bitterness towards your family or towards your in-laws. He can take your addiction that you have to alcohol or to porn or to, or to drugs. He can take the, the pride that you have in your family and in your job and in your wealth and in your looks. He can take all of that and the idolatry that we have of being this picture-perfect American family. He can take all of that and lay it at the foot of Jesus at the cross and he can give you freedom and transformation and forgiveness. So if you're a Christian in the room, you should be encouraged by verses like Romans 8.1. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That should be an encouragement for you. There is no sin too big for the cross of Christ. If you're not a Christian in the room, you can also find, forgive, or find encouragement from a verse like Romans 5.8. But God chose his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice that it says, while we were still sinners, not after you cleaned up your life. Not after you cleaned up your life. Because you can bring your mess to the Lord and he can handle it. 
He can handle it. He will help you find freedom, find forgiveness, and find joy in life. She goes to to the town, and that might be a beautiful way to end the story, but the story doesn't end there. She pursues, she reveals, or disciple-making pursues, it reveals, it transforms. And the last one is that disciple-making multiplies. Disciple-making multiplies. So this might be what we naturally think of when we think of make disciples. It multiplies. But, but I don't want you to think discipleship and just think another, another Bible study. I don't want you to think about another curriculum. Look down at verse 39. Here's what it says. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. And when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. So this is where transformation takes place. This is where the story jumps from evangelism to disciple making. Because she goes and she tells, and then the ones she tells now have come, and now they have accepted for themselves. He says, it's no longer based on your word, but we have seen and heard for ourselves. And so, so they, they have now been transformed themselves. The outcast gets, gets water at noon, finds the living water, and returns it to the town that kicked her out in the first place. What a beautiful story of transformation. Do you see how the, the, there's a circular pattern going on? Jesus pursues the woman. He reveals her sin to her. He reveals that he is the source of healing. She's transformed. She goes to the town. The, t- the town comes to Jesus. He reveals their sin to him or yeah, to them. And then they're transformed. And now there is a pattern going on. This is what happens. This is what disciple making looks like. Discipleship multiplies. It is never meant to stay with us. It was never meant to just land within these four walls. It was meant to go to us, change us, and then leave from us to go to someone else. We have to take it to our neighborhoods, into our schools, into our workplaces, into our friendships, to our roommates, into the to the water park. We have to be intentional about pursuing those who need this message. So you, you, when you hear good news, you share it. My aunt had good news the day Lily and I got engaged. She was so excited, she had to share it. She took a picture with me and, and Lily, and she posted it on Facebook. The problem was, Lily and I hadn't shared the news on Facebook yet. So my aunt was the person who broke the news of our engagement. She was so excited, she had to tell someone. So why, when it comes to the gospel of God and being in right standing before God, do we get quiet? Why do we get quiet? Why why do we keep it to ourselves? Why would we not take the risk to go tell somebody? We we need to, to tell somebody. There's a beautiful example of this. I don't have time to read it today, but in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, the very famous passage of scripture that tells us if you love the Lord your God, you're going to do all these things. You're going to remind yourselves of it as you walk and as you rise, as you sit, as you stand. He says, this is supposed to be an entire life ordeal. That you're supposed to be pursuing and loving the Lord all the time, but you're supposed to be doing it with other people. That, that passage of scripture is for parents, but it's also for everyone because disciple making is for everyone. We're supposed to be telling everyone about this. This, you and I have a mission. We are called to this mission. And so my, my encouragement for us this morning, as, as, we, as we wrap up, I want us to think about this. What happens when disciple making is done right? What happens when it's done well? In Psalm 78, 5 through 7, here's what it says. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them so that their, to their children that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Why do we do disciple making? It's not for the next generation. It's for the generation after the generation, after the generation, after the generation, times 10. It's for the kids you will never see that they may have hope in God. That is why we do disciple making. So we want to see our lives transformed by this. And so we pursue Jesus, we reveal our sin, and we fight against our sin. We're transformed by the power of the gospel. Then we go and we help 
someone else see those same things, multiply that effect to again and again and again. This is a calling for all of us, not just the staff. And so I hope that as we think about this, as we pray about this, that we might, as the old hymn says, it says, take the world, but give me Jesus, hopefully for the next generation. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you are a good father. I thank you that you have, have birthed in us a, a new spirit, a new life. I pray that we would, um, Holy Spirit, as we, as we think about what we've heard today, that we might take these words and we might take these truths and we would, we would wrestle with them, that we would think about our own pursuits. Are we really pursuing or have you become secondary to us? Have we really seen transformation or is it not there anymore? Are we, are we multiplying? Are we investing in someone else like we should? Lord, convict us where we, we need to be convicted. May we take the gospel and take it and see it spread to more and more disciples all over the world. Speak to us now. It's your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us? Would you stand with us as we respond?